see so many of you for an Aspire talk. And this is an, an, an overlap between Aspire and um, the Careers in Healthcare Day today, which I hope a lot of you have engaged with. It's been brilliant. Um, we're really lucky today that Penguin Books uh, got in touch with us and said they've got this amazing speaker, uh, um, Dr. Julie Smith. <coughs> uh, she's already well known to uh, TikTok uh, followers. Uh, and she has a lot to say about mental health, and she is a qualified, qualified and uh, experienced clinical psychologist. Um, and she's here to talk about her work and about uh, things that may concern you or anything that you want to talk about related to mental health and psychology. Um, so uh, welcome to her. And she's going to be interviewed today by uh, Anthony Padgett, who is well known to many of you. Um, so, but she would also really love questions from you. Um, so please do think of any questions that you'd like to ask her, uh, and then we'll, we'll save them for the end. Um, and also, there will be a feedback form at the end, and Penguin have very kindly uh, arranged for, to, for a copy of, uh, uh, for each of you, of her book. Uh, and so if you've swiped in there, you will receive a copy of her book. But make sure you fill in the feedback form as well. So can we have a big round of applause for Penguin first? <laughs> uh, and now I'm going to hand over to Dr. Judy Smith and Anthony Patrick. We're going to join in. <laughs> office here. Okay, great stuff. Okay, folks, so um, just like Shula said, uh, Dr. Judy Smith is a highly experienced clinical psychologist and got a massive online presence. We're talking millions and millions of followers. And so we're really lucky, really, today to have it here. Um, so we're going to ask about, I don't know, five, six, how many questions we can. Um, and then it'll be over to some student questions. Okay, so as we're going through, think about um, I mean, some pertinent questions that you want to ask and anything that you think is about. Okay. Okay. So, well, that was um, one of the first questions really um, is how do you motivate yourself uh, when it's so, so easy uh, to procrastinate? Yeah, motivation is a huge subject, isn't it? And it's something that comes up a lot actually. Um, things that I'm asked about online and stuff like that, you know, how to motivate yourself. And I, I've included a whole section on it in the book for that reason. And the thing is about that people get wrong about motivation is we often think that some people are motivated and some people aren't. You know, you're kind of just born with it, you can have it when you don't. And it's not true. So it, motivation is a feeling like any other, so it's like an emotion. So it will come and go like any other emotion. And for that reason, you can't rely on it. So if there's something that you really want to do that means a lot to you, you can't wait until you feel like it. You have to be able to kind of push yourself through when motivation isn't there. And there are kind of there are sort of two ways of looking at it really. You, there are things you can do to invite the motivation to be there more of the time and to in, increase the likelihood that it will be there more of the time. But there are also things you can do to push through and do things that are important to you that you need to do when you don't feel like it. Um, because everybody has those days, right? When you wake up and you know there's still stuff to do, but you really don't feel it today. So I guess if you're the things you can do to kind of invite motivation to be there more of the time include looking after yourself, you know, like all the things that our moms tell us to do more, like eat well and exercise and get enough sleep and all that kind of thing. And it's because they work. And I think you know my mum used to say that to me. I used to think boring but once I knew the science behind it I kind of thought well yeah she's got a point really so if you if you get enough sleep and you eat well and you do all of those sort of basic things that we know about it improves the chances that you're going to feel more energetic and more motivated in the moment you're not setting yourself up for, for success if you don't um, but also I guess it's, it's staying in touch with the reason you're doing something because why should you feel motivated to do something if it's not your goals and if it's not based on what you value or what you want for your life? You're going to feel more motivated if you've chosen to work on something based on something that's important to you, a mission you're on or you know, something you want to achieve in your life. So it's really important to get clarity on 
your values. So what matters most to you at that point in your life and why? And how do you translate that into behavior? So, you know, you might be, for example, studying, um, which is hard to do a lot of the time. No one really feels motivated to study, but you do it because you have some sort of vision around that it's going to help you to get to a certain part in your life, you know, something that you want to do, a career or something like that. But also you might see yourself as someone who always pushes yourself to your limits to see what you're capable of and what you can achieve. And, and if that's your value, then, okay, I've set myself this goal to, to reach my exams and, and, and pass them because I'm, I'm the kind of person, it's part of my identity, that I will always be someone who pushes myself and is the best that I can be at any one point. So if you have that as your value, then even if you wake up in the morning and you don't really feel like it, you're more able to push through. Um, and something I talk about, one of the skills I talk about in the book is um, opposite action, which is a skill that's often taught in therapy called DBT for people who are in high levels of distress, but actually you can use it all the time. And it's a skill of opposite action. So any kind of, any moment where you might sort of do some sort of action, it, it's initiated by an urge. So you have an urge to do something, which is this sensation you get in your body. And a lot of people will experience an urge and go straight into action. So they'll have an urge to do something and just do it. So you don't really notice the urge. But if you take the time to build your self-awareness around having an urge to do something, you realize that actually you get this moment to choose whether you go with that urge or whether you act opposite to it. So there might be times you have an urge to do something, but you don't do it. So um, you, know, you might have an urge to walk out the room, but you don't do it. You hold back. And the more you get practice that, noticing an urge, acting opposite to it, <laughs> you then build this strength to be able to use it when you most need it. So when you wake up in the morning and you really don't feel like getting up, you want to hit snooze again. Um, once you recognize that's just an urge and I can choose whether I go with it or whether I act opposite to it. Um, and it's just, it's so incredibly powerful. Um, let's say it's used in therapies for people who um, are really unwell and, and really struggling to, to manage high levels of emotion safely. Um, but again, it's something that actually, I, I use it all the time. Okay. Um, some, of the, some of the other questions we have, a lot about anxiety and stuff, and I don't know if any of the people have had a chance to um, look at some of the videos, or some of the TikTok videos, or your web page. Um, some really interesting things you talk about. And I guess you can answer this really, really quickly. Um, but we've talked, especially to the psychology students in the room, um, we talk a lot about anxiety, just talk about anxiety and all this testimony, and how sometimes anxiety can be helpful and quite productive. Um, but one of the things uh, we're thinking about, one of the things on your website you said, is one of your jobs is to make yourself unnecessary, which I think is real, you know, so it's a real cool thing. Um, how, you know, just some general tips, how do we help others who are feeling particularly anxious and not the desirable anxiety? Um, so, in terms of how do you help a friend who might be anxious? Uh, again, that, that's something I, I cover in the book actually is because for everyone who is struggling with their mental health, whether it's anxiety or anything else, there's a whole bunch of people around that person who are thinking, how do I help them? Like, what, what am I supposed to do to support them? And, and I think we often assume that we need to be able to solve the problem and we need to be able to make that feeling go away for them or, you know, in some way fix it. That's not true. You can be extremely helpful to someone who's struggling by simply having their back and being by their side and letting them know that uh, you'll get through it together. And there's this, there's this really lovely um, sort of explanation around the difference between sympathy and empathy online. And it's um, this idea that, okay, if someone's in a hole um, and they, they don't want to be in that hole, sympathy is like standing over the edge, looking down and going, oh yeah, that's, that's awful, isn't it? Empathy is getting down into the hole with them and saying, yeah, this is awful. Let's work out how we can get you out. And you do it together. And so it's this idea that actually you can you can sit by someone and just listen to them and not have to worry about saying exactly the right thing or making it all go away for them. And it, it, it's hugely powerful. And so I think... People often get worried about what's the exact thing I should say, and there isn't an exact thing you should say. It's more about how you make that person feel. So if they know that you care about them 
that if they're in distress, it matters to you, um, that will immediately make that person feel safer. So you're already, just by letting someone know that you have their back, you're already helping them to feel less anxious. Um, so you don't have to come at it with you know, all the tools and you don't have to be a trained therapist to help friends. So um, yeah, I would say hold back on the judgment, lead into curiosity. So just trying to understand. And it's also really okay to say to someone, I really care about you and I'm, I'm really worried about you and I have absolutely no idea how to support you. How would you like me to help you? What would, what would be the most helpful way for me to support you? Would you like to go for a walk and say nothing? Or would you like to talk to me? Or you know, would you like me to go to that doctor's appointment with you when you go and ask for help? Um, there are so many different ways that you can support someone. You don't have to have the answer. So you're not going to worry about trying to make sure it's just being around. Yes. Yeah. Good tips. Good tips and great metaphors. Um, there's a tricky one as well. Lots of emotions that we always feel all the time, really. Um, <laughs> but how can you really identify or what are there any tips to help identify what emotions you're feeling, like whether it be self doubt or anxiety? Any tips for identifying your emotions? Yeah, this is actually quite crucial, but not in the way that you think. So it's sort of. Um, there's this term called emotional granularity. So if you're able to feel something and give it a label, it helps hugely with your ability to then process that emotion and deal with it in a, in a healthy way. But you don't have to get it right. So you don't have to have the same label for your feeling as someone else has. It's more about how useful that is for you for identifying, I know this feeling, I know what we're dealing with, this is what I call it, and this is then what I do with it. So I wouldn't worry about, you know, if you're feeling something and you're not sure whether other people see that as self-doubt or anxiety or sadness or anger, it's more about you recognizing, okay, there's this feeling, this is where I feel it in my body, and this is now what I need to do with it. So, I mean, you can even use, um, there's a, a brilliant professor in America who talks about how to, to deal with this, and she says, you can even use um, words that aren't in your language to come up with, or a series of words, like a sentence to come up with, I don't know, that feeling you get when you're the last one to walk in the theatre before it all starts, or, you know, and, and so that you just recognise that that's a thing, and that's a moment, and that's what it feels like. If you're able to label a feeling, you you take some of the power out of it immediately. So you're able to see it for what it is, which is an experience that washes over you, and then you then get to choose how you respond to it. So um, it's a bit like, I mean, there's this old movie from the 90s with Jim Carrey called The Mask, where I mean, he puts a mark, great one, yeah, everyone hears to that. Uh, but he, he kind of finds, um, he finds this mask and, and when he puts it on, it kind of grips him around the back of the head and then it controls everything he says, everything he does, everything he feels. And it's a bit like that with emotions and thoughts. So when, when you're in it and that's all you see, it has control over what you do. Being able to label how you feel is a bit like taking that mask and just holding it back. And once you're not, it's not right in front of your face, it has much less power with you. It's just a mask then, right? So if you're able to kind of get a bit of distance from both thoughts and feelings, um, it's called diffusion. So you're able to then see it for what it is, which is an experience and often a biased one. And you're then open to seeing other perspectives and alternative ways of looking at stuff. Great tips. And a great film. Okay. Yeah. Um, <laughs> questions. I've had some, some suggestions for questions as well. But um, we're always comparing ourselves all the time, um, being in a lecture theatre, being in a new job, being in a new college, first day of new school. Um, how, have you any thoughts about how we deal with the anxiety of comparing yourself to others? Yeah. Like sometimes we can't help but do that. Absolutely. And I, and I hit when, you know, you often see like on Instagram and stuff, people are writing these like, just, just don't compare yourself to others. And actually, that's kind of asking you not to be human because we are social beings, so we're, we're made to live in social groups, and so our brains are set up to care what other people think of us, because it's a genuine danger, you know? And when you think about the sort of environment, where this is obviously a really new situation to kind of live in, but not so many years ago, it was a genuine danger if the people in your community were suddenly not okay with you, and might reject you, or abandon you, because you generally didn't survive that well if you were rejected by your group that you were living in. So 
our brains are still the same in that sense. And it's still, even in today's society, it's still a, a threat to your survival if, if you're rejected by, by the group of people that keep you safe and give you a sense of community. So um, it's okay to compare in the sense that it's normal and we'll do it. But it's really helpful to kind of educate yourself around how to do that in a way that gives you advantage compared to a way of doing that that will hold you back. So, I don't know, let's take social media. If you are scrolling through, um, maybe you follow, I don't know, models and movie stars and pop stars and you're comparing yourself to them and their life, it's likely that that's going to leave you feeling a bit worse than if you were comparing yourself to, um, let's say, how you did yesterday. Um, you know, you're on your own path, and and if you if you focus on comparing yourself to, you, you know, the things that you were doing in the past or the improvements that you've made, that's going to be a lot more fulfilling. And also, I guess you can you can take comparison. Let's say you compare yourself to someone who is doing something that you want to be doing in the future. That can either lead to envy, or it can lead to inspiration, and you can. Can focus on oh I'm terrible because I'm not doing as well as that person or you can kind of turn that around and look at what can I learn from that person they're doing so well I want to be there how can I learn from what they've achieved to be able to get there so it's always um I mean, metacognition is essentially our brain's ability so we have this amazing ability to think thoughts right but our brains also have this ability to think about what we're thinking about which is metacognition and that's that's the main kind of tool that is used, the fundamental tool that's used in therapy, is your ability to think something and then stand back and reflect on it. And if you're able to do that with comparison, so you might compare yourself to someone and then stand back and go, wow, that's not helpful for me to get on that road, or that really is, then then you have much more control over it. I think metacognition is really interesting. I think, I don't know, I don't know, that, that's one of the defining things that sets us out to species. You know, can the value ones do that? Yeah, it's impossible for us to know, isn't it? I think it's specific to ourselves. Yeah, yeah. Um, I've got a few more questions. Some of your great students have posed. Some of your thoughts thoughts on these, really. Um, I know, you know, I've heard about, you know, being a a highly experienced clinical psychologist um, in the NHS and your own practice and a huge presence online. Um, But has your online presence change the way you conduct your private practice? Yeah, so I only started, so I worked in the NHS for about 10 years, and um, then I moved into private practice, and I only started putting videos on social media just before the pandemic started. Um, and it was really based on the idea that, so all these people coming through for therapy, and um, people don't realize that when you go to therapy, you do a lot of talking, but you also learn a bit about how your mind works. So there's an educational element to that, where you learn about how to impact on your own mood, how to influence your emotional state, um, deal with relationship problems, that kind of stuff. And I found that so many people going through therapy, uh, once they had that bit of education, they found it so empowering to be able to manage their own life and day-to-day problems that they were sort of raring to go. And a lot that's where the title of the book came from. So a lot of people were saying, how on earth has nobody told me this before? This is not rocket science, but it's really, really changing my life. It's really helpful. So I wanted to make it more available. And that's the reason I started to put videos on, on social was um, to just get the education out there and make it available to people who perhaps didn't have access to therapy. And um, of course, that just went off like a rocket during the pandemic. So everyone's at home and struggling with, you know, all the stuff we were having to deal with. And so, um, yeah, there's lots of kind of, well, there's across platforms, I think there's about four million of us now. So um, that has really changed the way that I practice because my little private practice was just me, the one my band at home um, in the therapy room in my garden. <laughs> so I don't think I can really do that anymore. Um, but I, I haven't really faced that challenge yet because the people that are, obviously during the pandemic, everything went to video calls. So the, the, the patients I was seeing were on video calls and stuff. Um, from home, which is still happening, uh, but I don't think I can really return to um, invite people to my, my home. There's a sort of um, confidentiality issue there and a safety issue for me. So 
I don't know really. It's um, I can't see myself being able to be behind entirely because that's the work that I love. It's incredible um, privilege to be able to, to work with people in that way. Um, but we'll see. I, I mean, maybe I need to find an office somewhere and find some people like that. Yeah, it is, um, it is refreshing sometimes when you know someone online is actually qualified to give such advice. It's not you know, the clinical psychologists, there's all sorts of people um, promoting self-help videos and all yeah. sorts. I don't know if they've even practiced that. Yeah, do, and do you know that's a massive question I get about, you know, should you be sharing this stuff on social media? And I said, you know what, I can sit in my therapy room and see one person at a time and complain about the fact that everybody is on social media getting all this misinformation. Or I could get involved, put some evidence-based, good quality education out there and increase the chances slightly that someone searching for that kind of information might come across mine instead of someone else. So that was really sort of my justification in my mind really for sort of getting into the the kind of social media um, realm. Um, certainly if you if you don't get a chance to read the book I certainly mm -hmm. encourage you to, to visit the website and have a look at some of these short videos or go on TikTok and have a look at some of these short short um, videos because they're quite they're quite attention grabbing and um, there's lots of you know psychological truth behind them and so I do encourage you to um, one more kind of question for me really um, and you kind of already hinted at it. Um, do you think that providing, you know, lots of information and, you know, solid advice online for your book could ever be a, a true replacement for, a, you know, a replacement for traditional therapy? No, and it, and it was never meant to be that. So when I talked a bit before about the educational element of therapy, that's all that I share. So there's a lot that I don't share because it can't be. Um, translated in that way and um, but the, the videos are all based on the educational element of therapy or the, you know interesting research that's coming out that, that can be used in day-to-day -day life in real time to be helpful to people um, but no it's, it's definitely not a replacement for therapy at all and nothing beats sitting in a room one-to-one -one with a person getting to know them on such a level that the therapy room becomes people's sanctuary so it becomes a place you go that first session, you, you know, I don't know if anyone is ever thinking about going to therapy, but it's really scary. Um, and it's always really frightening and nerve-wracking that first time you go and see someone and you think you're going to be judged and you think, I'm never going to get it all in, I'm never going to be able to talk about this in a coherent way, and all those things are really, really normal. And by about second or third session, the room becomes your safe place. You realise, okay, this is the place where I can go. I can say anything. And it's okay to say it, and no one will ever find out about it. And I, you know, I've got someone here that can. So a therapist is almost like a mirror. They hold a mirror up to what's happening, and they will reflect back to you what you're offering out, so that you can get some clarity on. Oh right, this is what happened. Because often you go in with a he said, she said, then I got this, and then I did that, and it's really hard to see the wood for the trees when you're in it. But therapy gives you this sort of bird's eye view of your life, where you get to map out. Oh, that's why I'm so stuck in that cycle. Now I can see the way out. Right, now I can see how it can change. And, and it just, it, it helps that process of being able to make careful decisions about your life. Um, and you don't have to have a diagnosis. You don't have to, um, you know, meet some criteria for a mental health problem to find benefit from that either. So I would, you know, highly recommend it to anyone. I'm curious, folks. I'm curious. So, you know, we're getting better and better in this country about talking about our own emotions and accessing all sorts of therapies to help ourselves really. Um, can I just see a show of hands like how many of you would, you know, I guess given the circumstances, how many of you would, if you needed to, how many would, would you would be comfortable venturing online for therapy? How many of you would do that? In a really comfortable environment with Dr. Chi. See, things are changing, right? There's a lot of work to be done, mm. as you can see. Mm. There's still there's still a way to go, isn't there? Yeah. Because it's a really frightening thing to do, actually. Yeah. Um, but it's moving in the right direction. Because I think if you'd have asked that question mm. five, five years ago, yeah. probably no one would have been. Yeah, we've just been studying about um, uh, virtual relationships and online relationships and computer-mediated relationships and <laughs> the pros and cons to that and how it can be really, really useful for someone really, you know, scary, nerve-wracking for others as well. So 
I've got power outs that can stop you doing online face to face. Okay. Um, do we have any student questions? Well, that was a good question, actually, because I had quite a, an unusual experience. So I trained um, at Southampton, and um, uh, during that time they, uh, in Basingstoke, they opened up a very small six-bed ward for um, the Ministry of Defence. So it was purely for um, people that worked at the MOD, and, and at the time we were in Afghanistan, and, and there were all these uh, people coming back. Uh, with quite complex trauma and stuff and so I managed to somehow for my final year um, have that as my final specialist placement and then um, during that year my supervisor left and so when I qualified I stepped into his role and wow that was a massive learning curve it, incredible but also really really tough and I remember it was probably in hindsight it was probably very early on in my career to get that experience but um, yeah, hugely um, life-changing on me. I mean, I, I remember in that first year, I, I, I lived down in Ringwood, so that was a long kind of commute for me, and I remember spending a few of those commutes driving home, just sort of in floods of tears, just overwhelmed by the kind of stories I was hearing and stuff like that. Um, but then you also, sorry, through doing that experience, you kind of learn how to manage it. So actually, that, that drive home then became my... Um, this kind of zone where I got to just compartmentalize everything in my mind and review things that I heard that day, feel the emotion that it left me with, um, and then park it. And then home life was very separate. I think if I hadn't had that long commute, it probably wouldn't have been so, I probably wouldn't have been able to kind of leave it behind. But because I don't know if any of you guys want a career in psychology or, you know, think in that way, but it's not nothing, like it's really, you know, um, there's a sort of um, concept called vicarious traumatization where hearing other people's traumas uh, leaves you with your own sort of trauma response and stuff. Um, so self-care through the job's really important. So yeah, I did that and then I worked in the PQ, which is the intensive care wards for a bit, um, uh, and a few other wards in Southampton um, and we have like crisis teams where it's a 24 hour service, but it's um, dealing with people who are at home, but may or may not at any point need to come to hospital because they're not safe. Um, so quite the sort of severe enduring end of mental health. Um, and then I went, worked in the community and the reason I sort of went into private practice was because by then I had a couple of children and um, couldn't do it all, not well anyway. So I had this idea that I would Kind of work in school hours and stuff like that and just see a few, few clients during the day um although since i started social media that has kind of railroaded everything now i work harder than i've ever worked i think um yeah so that's another thing if any of you have kind of ideas about you know social media accounts and and that that might be an easy ride it's not it's really fun but it's it's not easy like it's round the book i think what Probably one thing that helped you was uh, the drive back through the blue forest. Yeah. That sort of drive through, <laughs> that sort of countryside can be therapeutic in itself, not just a walk. Yeah. All sorts of things can be therapeutic. <laughs> a great program yesterday about the therapeutic value of dogs, um, so I encourage you to seek a dog as soon as you can. Yeah. Um, uh, and then more questions. So I don't know your name, but go with blue hair. Yeah, I think um, the thing is, you people put themselves on this pedestal, don't they, to be able to like fix everything and and make it better. And you can't be, you can't expect yourself to be a therapist or to be the doctor that's gonna, you know, even doctors don't take people's problems away. Um, and and that's a really hard part of caring for someone who's struggling is that you you can't change someone's sort of core beliefs that they might have around whether they deserve help or not. All you can do is be very consistent in demonstrating to them with your actions that they are worthwhile to you. So um, 
you know, it might be something really simple like, okay, every week, me and you, we're going to go for a dog walk and we're going to distract you for an hour. Like, it's okay as well, I think, to not talk about the thing that's causing them the problem. And a lot of people think, oh, God, if, if my friend's going through something, every time we're together, we need to address it and we need to talk about it. And it's not true. Sometimes people can really value that friend that can make them laugh for a half an hour and just make them forget about their grief or their, you know, problem. Um, that's just as valid way of helping someone. Um, and so, you know, it's it's not necessarily your job to convince them with words that they deserve help or that they are, you know, to feel hopeful. It's um, just just be consistent and constantly remind that person that, that you care and it matters to you whether they're okay or not. Um, it, it has more more than, of an effect than you think it will. It goes back earlier to just being like a round being, being a yeah. sandwich with the salt there. Something like that was just cool. yeah. Any more questions? Suzanne? Yeah, I mean, I kind of often see like social media as a bit like road, <coughs> road. So roads are really helpful. No one's about to stop using them because if you use them right, it makes your life a whole lot easier. But at the same time, you wouldn't send your kids out to play in the road without teaching them how it works and what the dangers are and stuff like that. So I think it's all about recognizing um, this is a this is a world that is yet to be regulated. So it's about as unsafe as it's ever going to be. It's probably, you know, hopefully going to get better for the powers that be can make those changes. In the meantime, it's about um, looking after ourselves. And I mean, I've done quite a few videos on just reminding people that what you see online is not real and stuff like that. And that the power that you have is in who you follow. And I think it's easy to, you know, at the beginning when you join platforms, it's like, follow, 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 follow. And then you've got this feed and it can be having a powerful impact on how you feel. And if you're aware of that, so you know, if you follow someone and you're like scrolling through their page, be really aware of how that makes you feel when you shut the when you shut the app down. Because if it makes you feel worse than when you opened it, it's not helping you. It's not it's not adding to your life in any way. It's gonna make life harder for you. If you like I'm really intentional about who I follow, I follow people that make me feel inspired, that educate me, um, that I look up to, um, that leave me, maybe bring me joy, like I love sort of comedians and stuff online. So I know that when I shut down Instagram, I probably have a smile on my face, or I feel a bit inspired about, oh, what are we gonna do next? And that enhances my life. But I know that if I followed, I don't know, a bunch of celebs that make me feel like I don't look right or sound right or have enough money or whatever, I'm probably going to feel pretty rubbish after, so I just don't. Um, but it's really about taking control of your life in that way, and and your attention is your most valuable thing, and what you focus on will impact on how you feel and how you behave and the kind of things you believe about yourself. So you have to take control of that because no one cares more about your future and how you feel than you do. So you have to take responsibility for that and. Um, the most powerful thing you can do is unfollow uh, things that are making you feel terrible. I think checking the source, you know, I mean, some of your videos from clinical psychology is the huge social media presence. It's, you know, it's warranted advice for you in all these ways. Um, any more questions? something I wish I included. Um, well, the book is all about like real-time skills that work now. So, uh, and I split it into, it, there's no clinical diagnoses in there at all, because even though all the skills in there are taught in therapy, often to people who are really, really struggling, they're also helpful for everyone all of the time. So it's split into the kind of problems that we all face at some point. So everyone has days when you wake up and you're not feeling motivated. Everyone has days when your mood isn't as buoyant as you'd like it to be, or there's trouble in relationships, or you feel anxious, or you feel stressed and overwhelmed. It's one of those kind of problems that everyone deals with. 
um, and so that you can kind of dip into it and and take out what it is that you're dealing with at that point. You know, what would a therapist say if if I was in therapy but I was dealing with lots of stress, for example? Um, so I wanted it to be like real time skills that you can use right now. The stuff I didn't go into at all, because um, it's probably a whole other book, is dealing with past the past stuff. So uh, thinking about you know how has my childhood affected my adult life and um, how do I heal from past traumas and that kind of stuff. That's that's a whole other um, book I think. So I haven't I haven't dealt with um, you know um, dealing with sort of past and how to how to heal from that. Um, any more questions? Um, so, low mood. <coughs> I don't know if everybody heard that question. It's about kind of why why we spiral back down when we're when we're struggling and low mood gives us the urge to do the things that will keep us stuck so you know that moment i don't know you wake up in the morning and you feel rubbish and the urge is to hit snooze like 10 times and call the duvet over and maybe not go to college today or whatever it is and that's low mood giving you those urges to kind of hide away and withdraw and, and sometimes you need that, right? Sometimes you just need a rest, and that's the reason you have low mood in the first place. But sometimes um, it's something else that's caused that low mood. And sometimes withdrawing, or withdrawing for too long, doesn't help you to lift your mood. It actually increases the chances your mood is going to go down. So if you shut away the world, and you stay at home, and you scroll on social, or you ruminate about everything you regret, or a relationship that's going down the path, then you're going to feel worse, and and that's something I've included in the book is a sort of basic formulation from cognitive behaviour therapy, which is a therapy that's based on the premise that how you feel is so heavily influenced by what you do or don't do, the focus of your attention and your how you speak to yourself in your head, and how you treat your body and your physical state, and you can't wake up in the morning and go right today I want to feel love and excitement and passion, right? We can't kind of directly choose our emotions in that way, but because our emotional state is so heavily influenced by those other three things, we can use those other three things to impact on how we feel. And they're so closely entwined. They're like, they're like weaves in a basket. So um, we kind of don't necessarily always notice the more we experience the basket as a whole, but if we take time to reflect and kind of tear them apart a bit, we can notice, okay, when I'm feeling that, I'm often heavily focused my attention on that maybe i'm ruminating a lot or i'm worrying a lot and i'm you know saying no to go out with my friends more or i've not exercised for two weeks but also when you feel great um what do you do differently then like what are you focused on on your best days what what's your mind focused on um how do you talk to yourself in your head differently what do you do differently how do you talk to other people differently um do you move your body more and those kind of things so you can kind of begin to you know, learn from the good days as well as the bad days, but it really is about recognizing that, yes, when I feel rubbish, it will give me the urge to do the things that are going to make it worse. So there is this pain barrier of having to go against those urges to do what you know is going to help in a minute. But things that, the things that help instantly tend to be the things that will keep you stuck. Beautiful. Um, any more questions? Um, it's it's dictated by what anyone brings into the room, and that's what it's, that's why I love the job so much. Is because um, someone once said to me when I was training, "Oh, do you want to go into like neuro and brain injury?" Because it's 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 more clear that like there's a right and a wrong, and you know exactly what to do. That person was a medic, actually. Um, but part of what is incredible about therapy is that every person who comes into the room brings something different, and you can never ever leave emotion out of it because that's what drives us right people aren't actually driven by logic we feel something we base we, we base our actions on that feeling and then we justify it with logic afterwards so often it's a bit of a kind of 
red flag if someone comes into therapy and they kind of over intellectualize everything it's like hang on a minute what's what's under there what's the feeling that came first and um you often learn much much more about someone if you can open that that part up. so yeah probably led more by motion it kind of touches up on what the other students uh, questions really Ava about she was asking about how your work affects you emotionally um, you suggested earlier you know when you did your early training in the MOD and stuff and trying to detach yourself from that does it still affect you emotionally oh hugely and I think I think the day that it stops affecting you emotionally you should probably stop doing it you know because you need to be able to be in the room with someone um, and sit with them and contain their deepest most raw pain you know that people tell you things that they've never told anyone and um, if if you're not affected by that probably because you're not being empathic enough so I think it's about allowing yourself to be impacted by that but then also taking care of yourself so that you can manage uh, what comes up for you and it's not unusual for therapists to have their own therapy and we all have to have legally we have to have clinical supervision so you meet with another psychologist who and you talk about the cases you're working with and and how it's affecting and stuff like that so um but yeah it's 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 not an easy sort of emotionally easy job but really meaningful um any more questions Kenzie you've had a hand up ages Uh, no, I mean, um, something about sort of clinical training is you kind of, you learn all the kind of the theory and the, the evidence phase and stuff like that, and, and it opens your mind to mental health uh, with a whole kind of new perspective. But that, that, that science is ongoing, that research is ongoing all the time. So, you, you know, we are kind of building this picture um, and it's sort of being created in front of our eyes, really. But you also learn from the people we work with as well. Um, that things, you know, the, the, the picture just, and the puzzle keeps getting built upon. And and so, yeah, I feel like I have a, a pretty good understanding from, from my training and the people I've worked with. But it's, it's a bit like, you know, it's a bit like medicine, biology. There's still so much we don't know, <coughs> which makes it fascinating because we can keep learning and, and the research that's coming out is, is pretty incredible and, and helpful. Um, so yeah, I guess it's just like anything else where we just, we, you feel like you know something and then science tells you something new and you go, oh yes, okay. It's like opening a new new room and turning on a light and you go, oh, I didn't realize this bit was here. And, um, but that's what makes, you know, these kind of jobs really interesting. Uh, great question, Kenzie. Um, just on that one, do you, do you think sometimes in therapy sessions, um, it's still like a reciprocal nature, you still learn things all the time? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I have learned more from my patients than I've taught them probably. Um, it, yeah, absolutely. It's um, that's what makes the. I mean, we often say to like trainees and stuff when they're just starting out and they're going into the therapy room that you will feel completely de -skill. You know, you, you go, you learn all these skills, and in theory, and then you go into the real therapy room. And you think, How am I going to help this person? And what am I going to do? And, and uh, that, that's normal. Um, even as a highly, highly experienced clinician? Um, yeah, uh, well, I guess you, you get to the point where you, you trust that that's part of the process, mm -hmm. that, that if, you, if you keep learning about someone, it becomes easier. But, but when you're working um, in the sort of acute um, mental health services where people are really, really poorly, um, and often in the NHS, because there aren't many psychologists, um, you only get to see the most complex cases where everyone else is really struggling to know what to do next, uh, which makes the job kind of tough. Um, yeah. Okay. Any more questions? These have been great questions so far. Any more student questions? No pressure. Okay, go ahead. Yeah. Um, a, did you all 
Yeah, I mean, psychology degrees are so wide. I think you learn such transferable skills for the un from the undergrad degree. Um, the, I mean, a friend of mine that was on the same course went to work at Wimbledon afterwards and stuff. So she went into kind of sports and management. And so you learn lots about um, how to kind of articulate yourself, how to communicate with people and that kind of thing. Um, it doesn't really sort of narrow down until you do clinical training and do the doctor afterwards. So I... I didn't really, I don't feel like I chose it. Um, I, I did a, psych, a psychology A-level because it was offered at our little sit form in Ringwood um, and it sounded interesting. Um, and then when I did the A-level, I thought, actually, this is really interesting. And it just, I don't know, it just fit with my interests. And, and so it's easier to do well when you find something interesting, right? Um, and then I, again, had no idea what I wanted to do or even to go, you know, everyone seemed to be going to uni and psychology sounded interesting and I was I was finding it good so I kind of thought oh, well let's let's try that then still had no kind of career plan at all um, and then when we got to uni it's really interesting so I went to Exeter for my undergrad um, when I got there on it was almost like the first day it was like freshers week or something and they said um, uh, yeah psychology degree people you know if you want to be a clinical psychologist you've got to be um, you've got to get a first and then you've got to be willing to like volunteer for four or five years or something and like hardly any people do it so it put us all off including me but wow i you know never get it at first and I, I can't afford to work for free for five years um so that will never happen uh and then i went to this tutor and this this young guy who was like a phd student or something he said you know a first is um is achievable by anyone you've got to be willing to put the hours in to do the work to get it. Uh, that kind of then sunk in for me because I thought, well, I'm not the cleverest person in the room, but I know how to work hard and I know how to apply myself. And, and so I did, I just went for it and I, I kept that in my mind the whole three years. And, and I, I, yeah, I worked my guts off and, and got the grade. And then, and then when I came out, um, I still didn't really know that I wanted to do that. Um, but followed my interests. So there was a job in a in an addiction, addictions unit as a research assistant. I thought, yeah, that sounds really interesting. Let's go for it. And someone who was also working there as assistant psychologist um, was on the path to doing training and said, why don't you try this? And and so um, I did that and then trained, did my doctorate at uh, Southampton. Um, but yeah, so I just followed my interests. And I think that is so crucial you don't have to have a set path. You don't have to know. How can you possibly know what a job is like until you get anywhere close to seeing someone do it? And I didn't until I was working under a psychologist. Um, you just got to follow what what lights you up and what really interests you because it's so much easier to excel at something if you love it. Um, I just can't imagine like ha with how hard I work now. If I was not interested in psychology. I would have given up way before now. It just wouldn't have been worth it. Um, so yeah, whether it's psychology or whatever else, I just make sure you love what you're doing, and you're more likely to end up in a job that you like. <laughs> Any more questions, Oscar? How's your, um, your training and experience affected you in terms of being Oh, um, probably adds more guilt because I'm more aware of when I'm making the mistakes. I'm like, oh, I shouldn't have said that. Um, uh, yeah, it, do, it does. Because I read a lot, because I'm just the part I love about something is learning about it and, and reading all the latest research and stuff like that. And I don't know if you guys have ever been spoken to about um, like growth mindset and the work of Carol Dweck and all that kind of stuff. And, and when I read her book, right, I'm going to, you know, really get my kids into a growth mindset and we're going to, you know, um, we're only going to reward effort and, and uh, you know, it doesn't happen all the time. But I think you have to then just forgive yourself for being human and um, that there's no perfect parent out there. You also have to kind of like 
practice what I preach in terms of um, being willing to be an imperfect human and just repair afterwards, I guess. Any more questions? Um, I guess for when it comes to careers, I probably echo what I said before about just follow what's interesting. And the thing is, you can kind of at, at this age, and I totally get the stress because I, I'm in my, I'm in my thirties, and I I only just really sort of discovered this that you don't have to seek your parents' approval. <laughs> You can, it's a lifetime kind of story for us all, I think, in terms of um, trying to meet everyone's expectations of you. And, and once you kind of almost free yourself from feeling like you have to do that and recognizing that the most important person to seek approval of is yourself. And, and when you get clarity on your values and what matters to you, and I don't mean what is gonna to happen to you, I mean, what kind of person you want to be. So no matter what happens to me in my life, I want to be this, this, and this. This is how I want to respond to difficult times. Once you get clarity on that, you then, you then can measure your actions against your own sense of approval. So am I okay with behaving like this? Am I okay with treating other people like this or treating myself like this or working this hard or not taking care of myself? <laughs> am I okay with that? And, and when, you, when you sort of focus on sort of meeting your own sense of approval it's much easier to deal with criticism from the outside it like creates this sort of this armor that that you know you want to be and and it's okay then if other people aren't okay with that um for mental health i would say it fluctuates in everybody nobody is immune from this stuff and and as you go through life and you hit hard times which you will at some point um your mental health will fluctuate, and that's okay, that's normal, it's because you're human. Um, you don't have to wait until someone says you have this diagnosis or that diagnosis before you seek help with that. Just the earlier you do it, the easier it is. It's easier to dig yourself out of a ditch than it is a massive hole. So at any point that you feel you're not okay, take it seriously and take responsibility for it, do something about it. That might be going to a friend or it might be doing the things you know you need to do to pick yourself back up, or it might be telling a parent or going to the doctor or seeking therapy, whatever it is for you, do it. Because once you get yourself into a really tough place, it's so much harder to get yourself back out. Any more student questions? Kenzie again. Uh, yeah, and I don't think knowledge is a bad thing. Knowledge is a really great thing and is your absolute superpower. Like, if the more you can know about stuff, the better, because the more you're able to make informed decisions. And but I would say question everything that you see online. So don't don't take anything at face value, and um, you know get several opinions or try and go to the source. Or you know th that is your power is in being able to not just accept what you're told, but to question it. I guess that's what you learn at uni um, as well is is how to you know tear things apart and work out what's uh, what's the most valid reflection of reality and what's not. Um, but yeah, never take anything at face value because I mean, but also I'm not opposed to self-diagnosis. I think, you know, a lot of people like journalists and stuff say to me, oh, you know, should you be sharing stuff online? Because what if people self-diagnose? I'm like, do you know what? If, if someone watches one of my videos and then says, oh, maybe I've got depression, and then they go to the doctor, the doctor's there to, uh, the doctor's not just going to accept a self-diagnosis and give them medication. They're going to do their own assessment and then work out what can help this person. So it's okay if you think you might have something, some sort of problem, and you're worried about that, you can go to a doctor, and they will, it's their job to help you work out what's going on. 
So um, in, I also, you know, I think it's okay for someone to go, oh, maybe I'll, that's the criteria for, I don't know, OCD. Maybe, oh, maybe that's me. Maybe I should go and check. That's a good thing as far as I'm concerned because if it seeks, gets people to seek help, that's really positive. Anyone? It can be, it can be, and um, in the NHS it's kind of set up in this way where they've got like um, uh, sort of private care services and stuff where you can sometimes have like telephone sessions and stuff and you get a set number so you get like six sessions um, and for some people that is great and that is enough. For the people that it's not enough, they could sometimes then come out and think, oh, is there a for me? Um, actually in my private practice, a lot of people I would Get referrals from is people that have, you know, been through a service like that and felt that it's not enough, and then and then sort of been kind of seeking out something more. Um, but yeah, if people have a bad experience, it can then really put them off, um, which is really tragic because often when you find the right person for you, um, it can be life changing. I mean, I never, I so I set up my private practice right, and I thought, God, I'm going to have to advertise and do all this kind of stuff. It's just not the case. So when people go to therapy, it's really private because they're struggling. And then they learn all this stuff and they get better. And then they go off into their life and they meet someone else who says, oh, my friend's really, really struggling. And they go, oh, you've got to try that. It really worked for me. And so once you kind of, once you get better and you're in really a good place, you're more willing to share the stuff that helped. And I think that's where this incredible movement is happening with mental health, where people are more willing to talk about, yeah, my therapy really helped, or I did that and that helped. And the more discussions we have like that, the more people are able to access what they need and um, and address their mental health in the same way they do with a physical health. I mean, I dream of a day where um, it's okay to say, do you know what, guys, I can't make it tonight because I've got a therapy appointment, as it is to say, do you know what, I can't make it because I've got a GP appointment why should they be any different why should it be any different to work on your brain as it is to work on the rest of your body um to me it's just uh, it was moving in the right direction but i think there's a long, long way to go yeah, definitely moving in the right direction um okay so i think uh, we'll wrap it up there i think um i think it's been a very uh, interesting talk especially on educational advice career advice mental health advice, parenting advice, um, life advice, uh, all sorts within like an hour really. Um, so could you join me please and give uh, Dr. Julie Smith a big round of applause. a series of talks that we run as Penguin. If you search for Penguin Talks, you can go online and watch all our other talks, which include Stormzy, Michelle Obama, uh, Bernadine Evaristo, we've got loads of content to do to pick it out. Um, I'd love if you can fill out our feedback form. It's only 10 questions and it helps us to know if you enjoyed the talk, what you enjoyed about it, and how we can make this even better. Um, and as your teacher mentioned, we do have a book for you, which will be coming tomorrow or on Monday. So if you hand in this form, you can make sure you all um, get that book and hope you enjoy reading it. So let's give another clap for the book.